Thanks for those joining us online. Thank you for those uh, visiting with us today. Um, like Phil mentioned, it is Memorial Day weekend, so please take time to reflect on what that means. Teach your children what that means, and thank God for what that means, because there's people that, who laid their lives down and aren't here today so that we could meet here freely today. So, if we haven't met in person, uh, please forgive Pastor John's way of announcing me as speaker this week. Uh, he, he told me he was going to announce. Uh, he just didn't tell me how he was going to announce. So in your future, when John asks you to do something, feel free to do it, but just know that he might have something up his sleeve. Um, today we're going to be looking at the book of Job, the last half, or not even the last half, I'm sorry, the last conversation that Job has with God. We're going to be in um, Job 38 through 42. Um, as you turn there, I just want to share a story with you um, that I heard a while ago that really just, I feel, falls in line with uh, today's message of who, you are who are you listening to. There were two lawyers who had to fly to Alaska, and they had to fly off the mainland of Alaska onto an island. They had to do some research, some investigation, and have some conversations with some people. So they were up there for a few days, did what they had to do. And then on their return flight, they had to take a small twin-engine plane off the island to the mainland of Alaska, and from Alaska they would go home. So the small twin-engine plane had three seats. The pilot was up front, one, one um, lawyer was up front, and then uh, the other lawyer was in the back uh, with the luggage in his seat. About five or ten minutes into the flight, the pilot passed out. He was unresponsive. They couldn't get him to come back. The lawyer up front instinctively grabbed his throttles on his side and tried to figure out how to fly the plane. As he's looking at the dash and the lights and all the switches and the gauges and trying to figure out what means what, out of the corner of his eye, he located a walkie-talkie radio. He grabbed the radio and handed it to the guy in the back and said, you have to call for help. Our only way of surviving this flight and giving ourselves a chance is to make contact with somebody else who can help us. So they came up with a plan. They figured they would just say, mayday, mayday, help, help. They would stay on a channel for a minute or two. And then if nothing was, nobody responded, they would switch to the next channel. And they would repeat the process, repeat the cycle over and over. Finally, after several attempts, somebody responded. It was another pilot who was flying out of Anchorage overseas. And once he gathered their information, what their situation was and what exactly was going on, he said, don't leave this channel. I'm going to get in touch with Anchorage Ground Control. The next person that comes on this radio will come on this channel and talk to you and guide you through your next steps. A few minutes later, Anchorage Ground Control comes on and says, I understand that there's a small twin-engine plane. There's two um, two passengers who are now flying this plane, is that correct? Yes, absolutely. The, uh, the voice over the radio said, I'm here to help. Listen to my voice. He said, I'm going to be honest with you. You have a pretty rough hour and a half to two hour flight from where you are now to Anchorage. But if you listen to my voice, you'll give yourself the best chance that you have. And I will get you here. He said, you do have two choices. You can do what you want. And he goes, I'll warn you, those who choose that option are the ones who take themselves out. They always crash 100% of the time because they choose not to listen to my instructions. Obviously, they chose to listen to the voice over the radio. And he said, I'm going to give you a, a rundown of what you're going to face. You're in for a rough ride. He goes, you're about five, five minutes out from the first mountain range. And after that, there's several after that. He goes, after you pass over multiple mountain ranges, you're going to encounter some serious turbulence. And after that, coming into Anchorage, we have some pretty bad weather, and you're going to have to ride out the storm. But he said, if you listen to what I say, my instructions, when I tell you, you'll make it. But I need you to focus on my words. I need you to block out what you're thinking, what you're feeling, and what your body is telling you. If you listen to my voice and my voice alone, you'll make it. An hour and a half later, they had a rough landing, but they landed in Anchorage because they chose to listen to the voice. 
Guys, we have the Word of God, and we've been given the map, the compass, the survival guide to navigate the storms of this life, the ups and downs of the mountain ranges and valleys, the storms of this life, the turbulence of this life. We have everything we need in the Word of God. But the question is, who are you listening to? Who are we listening to? That is the question. I have some, uh, some personal questions that you can kind of take an evaluation of where you're at and how you would answer these questions. But I just want you to kind of have your mind and heart uh, in action this morning. So my first question for you is that in this world and society and culture where we constantly see people trying to fill the voids of their lives with activities and substances, who are you choosing to listen to? In this world that is increasingly more and more chaotic and increasingly more and more carnal and more and more out of control, who do you find yourself listening to? In a world that says that there is no absolute or authoritative truth, that you can find or you can make up your own truth, who do you find yourself listening to? By the way, there is absolute truth. Anything else is just an opinion. My fourth question is, is this. In a world that promotes the wisdom of man and tries to remove God and minimize God from every single conversation and every single possible aspect of life, who do you find yourself listening to? My fifth question is this, and it might be the toughest one because it's personal. In your seasons of suffering and hurt and confusion, turmoil, tragedy, hardships, and abandonment. Who do you find yourself listening to? See, today we're coming in on the tail end of the book of Job, and Job is a man most of us are familiar. If you're not, here's the short of it. Job was a, a good man. He had a great reputation. He was very wealthy. God had blessed him abundantly. But Satan wanted to test him because he thought that Job only trusted God and had such a great relationship with God because of what God had blessed him with. So Satan wanted to test him. He wanted to see if he could make his faith crumble and if his faith was built upon what he had. So Satan gets permission from God. God allows this to happen. Satan catastrophically causes Job to lose everything. His possessions, relationships, his family. Job is left broken. He's left broke. He's crushed emo emotionally, and he is painfully afflicted physically. Now, we can see throughout the Bible there are four reasons that there's hard seasons in our life. The first one is that simply we live in a fallen and broken world. That's first. Secondly, like we just saw in Pastor John's um, overview of the life of David, our own choices can lead to consequences in hard seasons. Uh, thirdly, um, in the, uh, the story of Abraham, God tests Abraham's faith, wants to see if Abraham is willing to sacrifice the things that are closest to him, if they trust God. And lastly, the fourth reason that we have hardships in this life is that Satan will attempt to derail our faith and destroy our trust in God, his word, and his promises. And we see that example, too, in the book of Job, but we also see it in the New, New Testament when uh, Jesus tells Peter that Satan wants to sift him like wheat and to test him. In our seasons of trials and suffering, Keep in mind, there's, there's four things to keep in mind. Two of them are what Satan wants, and two of them are what God wants. The first thing that Satan wants is for us to doubt God and to believe our fears and our doubts. He did this with Eve in the garden. He, got, he, he tried to persuade Eve to doubt God and what he said and his promises. He uses the same tactics, just a little different in different situations. So Satan wants us to doubt God, and he wants to, us to believe our fears and our doubts. God wants us to doubt our doubts and to believe in him. The longer a season of suffering and hardships in our life, the more Satan wants us to question God, his, wo <coughs> excuse me, his word, and his character. 
God wants us in the longer seasons of hardship and suffering to trust him, to be patient, to grow, to mature, and to remain faithful and see him work in these seasons. Ultimately, in Job's life and and our stormy seasons of life and hardships, we're going to wrestle with this question. Will we allow our theology, what we believe and know to be true about God, be determined by our current situations and difficulties? Or, on the flip side, despite these circumstances and hardships that we face and that Job faced, are we going to choose to trust God and see him remain faithful and true? And it's been said that everyone falls into one of three categories. The first is you're in a storm already. The second is that you're coming out of a storm and a hardship. And the third one is that you're heading into one. So I think this question, this message, in some way, shape, or form should apply to everyone. And if it doesn't apply to you today, tuck it away for when you need it. If you're not already there, please turn to Job 38. We'll start looking into what the Word of God says and what He has for us from His Word. Before we get in, uh, let's take a moment and pray. Father God, today is a good day to be in church. I thank you that we live in a country where we can meet and gather unoppressed, thankful for those who've laid their lives down to protect those freedoms that we have. Lord, I pray that this common story would not be common to us today. I pray that we would look upon your word with fresh eyes, soft hearts, and open minds to see what you have for us, Lord. I pray that those who are in the midst of turmoil, whether it's public or private, Lord, I pray that you would speak to them. I pray that this word today would encourage them Lord, I pray for just the rest of us as as your children, Lord, that uh, this will just remind us of your promises, of your character, and who you are. Lord, we thank you for the love that you have for us and your willingness to lay your life down for us, to redeem us and call us your own. So we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The first point of this text is that in every trial and every difficult season, provides an opportunity for God to show up and to show out. I'm going to read the first four verses of Job 38, and you can follow along. Then the Lord answered Job out of the storm, and he said, Who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you will answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. A couple things to notice about just coming out of the block. Job had built up in this, up to this point. He had argued his innocence. He had argued his character. He had argued the life that he lived with his friends who came to support him. Job had taken the hard seasons that he was facing and encountering, and he had turned it and made it about himself. And in doing so, he challenged the character of God. He, he, uh, he challenged the characteristics of God. He challenged the promises of God. He challenged God's justice and God's authority. Notice how God comes in. The word Lord should be capitalized, every single letter in your Bible. That, when it is done, refers to the Hebrew name Yahweh. That is the highest name given to God in the Hebrew language. So God comes in with authority And notice Job's in the midst of his own storm and and what comes along. A storm. Now remember also, man cannot look at God and his glory and his perfection and live. So God came covered and concealed in a storm. It is in the storms of life that provide God a great opportunity to get our attention, to move powerfully, to speak to us and redirect us. And that's exactly what he did here with Job. He got Job's attention, and then he redirected it. Also, we can see an example of this. Think of uh, Peter in the New Testament when he walked out on the water. It wasn't on a smooth sea. It was on a stormy sea. 
Jesus called Peter out of the boat. Peter, Peter stepped out of the boat, got on the water, the rough water, in the midst of a storm, rain, lightning, thunder, turbulence, and violence. And when he kept his eyes on God, which we're supposed to do, he did great. He did what no other human has ever done. He walked on the water towards Jesus, but what happened when he took his eyes off of Jesus? Immediately he sank. And so it is with us. When we're in our storms of life, stay focused on God. The storms want to distract you from him. They want to pull your attention from him, and they want to cause you to doubt who he is. In verse 2, basically, God says, Job, who do you think you are? He says, who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? He says, Job, you don't even understand what you're saying. He says, who are you to question my wisdom? Who are you to undermine my sovereignty? Who are you to disrespect my authority? You have no idea what you're talking about. You're using words without knowledge or experience or even understanding. In verse 3, he kind of sets the stage. By the way, in this text, this is the longest dialogue between God and a human. There's over 70 questions that God asks Job, and I don't have the time today to get into every single one. But I would highly recommend that you do so because it, I think it will give you a new appreciation for who God is and what he's done. But Job says, like I said, Job had challenged God's authority. In vindicating himself and trying to stand up for his own innocence, he had, he had questioned a lot of God's character. In verse 3, God says, Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. I kind of like that. I feel like God's rolling up his sleeves and saying, you want to have a conversation? You better get ready. In verse 4, this, this is the first question. So when God leads in with something like this, I think you should take notice. And I think if this were the first question asked to me in this situation, I, said, I think I would say I get the picture. But he says, where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. You see, God had to redirect Job and put him into the right perspective and position to understand who he was questioning. He said, do you get the picture now, Job? Before the earth even existed, I was. He said, Job, you're a created being. He goes, <clears throat> do you understand? Do you understand who you're talking to? God had, to remind God, God had to remind Job that he was a created being and not the sovereign creator. God is the only one who has the authority to oversee everything and to rule over everything. Isaiah 64, 8 puts it this way, O oh Lord, you are the potter and we are the clay. We are the works of your hands. Isaiah understood that he was a created being, that God was a creator, and that God has the authority. The second thing to see in this chapter of 38 of Job is that God demonstrates his dominion over creation, his control over nature, and his, uh, and his control over every situation. God questions Job about earth's creation, who established the boundaries of the seas and the land, who created the clouds, who made darkness and light, who commands the morning and the dawn, who, can, who created and commands the weather. He talks about snow and ice, lightning, rain, deserts, ice, things that Job was familiar with, but Job had overlooked. Notice with me verse 31 and 33 of chapter 38. It reads, Can you bind the beautiful Pleiades? Can you loose the cords of Orion? Can you bring the constellations in their season? Can you lead the bear with her cubs? Do you know the laws of heaven? Can you set up God's dominion over the earth? So God takes Job on a quick walk through creation. And he takes a look around, talks about things like weather. And then he turns his eyes up towards heaven and directs his thoughts towards the stars and the constellations and says, Hey Job, 
Who controls the stars in the heavens? Is it you? Whose job is that? Who has the authority to do that? God and God alone. So God takes Job through a walk of creation, which I think this text, if you read Genesis 1 and 2 and get the day-by-day account, I think that's a great summary and a great outline of creation on what happened each day. And then if you read that and then you follow it with this text, I think it's going to give you a greater appreciation for all that God's done, everything that he's made, and also his character. So God starts having Job look at different things, like I said, the weather, the stars. In Job 39, or 38, starting in verse 39 through chapter 40, God transitions from nature and animals to different cycles and how he's provided for different uh, cre- creations. He talks about the lion, he talks about the raven, he talks about the mountain goat, and we'll come back to that one in a second. He draws Job's attention to deer and wild donkeys and wild oxen, ostriches and horses, hawks and eagles. God shows Job that he designed and created and cares for every single animal on this earth. God rules over them all, and he takes care of them all. Let's take a quick sidestep into verse 1 and 4 of chapter 39. It reads like this, Do you know when the mountain goats give birth? Do you watch when the doe bears her fawn? Do you count the months until they bear? Do you know the time when they give birth? They crouch down and bring forth their young. Their labor pains are ended. Their young thrive and grow. Strong in the wilds, and they leave, and they do not return. Why do I make a point about this? Well, this is a hot topic in our society, and I think it's worth noting. In those four verses, God addresses the following things. He addresses procreation. He addresses pregnancy and the gestational process. God addresses birth. They are all by God's design, designed his way. And I know that people today think that they can dictate and tell us how things are. But I think it's interesting to note that God made things very obvious, and he makes them so obvious that he just puts them out in nature. God is the one who's designed everything. There are systems and cycles that exist in this earth, on this earth, and even in the universe we live in. God is the one who designed procreation, pregnancy, the gestational process, birth, the labor process, all by his design. So think about this too. These are things that Job had to think about and I think it's worth us digging deeper into. God designed flight. He designed strength. He designed abilities and capabilities. Every creature and every system functions by design and with purpose. It is God's design and God's purposes that there is procreation, pregnancy, birth, and life. An intelligent design automatically means that there is one who is the intelligent designer. Job had to be reminded of that, and in our society, I think it's important that we remind ourselves of that. In Job 40, we'll look at verse 6 and verse 11, and we're going to see the third point. God briefly defends himself here. Not that he had to or needed to, because he was doing a pretty good job of it already. But in verses 6 through 11, this is what it reads. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. He said, brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Would you discredit my justice? Would you condemn me to justify yourself? Do you have an arm like God? Can your voice thunder like this and then adorn yourself with glory and splendor and clothe yourself in honor and majesty? Can you unleash the fury of your wrath and look at every proud man and bring him low? Basically, God says, Job, can you do the things that I can do? Can you do the things that I've already done? I am just. I am sovereign. I am governing. This world, the universe, every aspect of life with total perfection and divine authority. God defended himself personally. He was doing a pretty good job of walking Job through creation, different aspects of that, but 
He got personal in this text. And then he continues walking Job through more of his creation. And I wish I had more time to get into it. He discusses the behemoth and the the Leviathan. Two awesome creatures. And he gives each of them almost about a full full chapter of text to describe each one of them. And if God is willing to give that much detail about two of his creatures, how much could he talk about you and me and the way he's made you and me? Because when he made you and me, he made us with purposes. He made us with specific designs, intentions. You are who you are because he wanted you to be who you are. Don't waste what God has made in you. Find out what he's made in you. Lastly, we're going to look at Job's response, and we see this in Job 42, verses 1 through 6. It reads like this. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No plan of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this that obscures my counsel without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things that I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now, and I will speak. I will question you, and you shall hear me. My ears have heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. First thing to notice is that he acknowledges God's supreme authority. He says, now I know. When he was accusing God, he thought he knew, but he didn't. After God takes him on a 70-question tour, Job finally got it. Job understood that he was accusing the Almighty God, and he wasn't doing it from experience. Job says that he now realizes that God can do all things because God made it clear for him, and I think we should take note of this, that God can do anything and has done everything because of who he is. Job realized that he was under God's authority and it had been wrong for him to question God's justice, his character, and who he is. But thankfully, we have verse 5 and verse 6 where he humbles himself and he repents. He changes who he thinks God is and he changes his heart. He has a new respect and a new appreciation for who God is and what God's done. Job humbled himself, his attitude, his thought process, his proud stance, his self-righteous position, and he acknowledges God's sovereignty and he repents. So what about you and me? Where do you guys find yourselves? Where do I find myself? You find yourself in a season where you're questioning God, why? Give God a chance, give him time. Let him prove himself faithful. It's in the storms of life that God will appear and get your attention. And it's through the storms of life that God proves who he is. So if you're in a storm today in your life, stay focused on Jesus, stay in his word, and watch him stay faithful. If you're heading into a storm, determine beforehand to stay focused on Jesus and his word. And if you're coming out of a season of storms, finish well, then find someone who you can help. Lastly, if you're here today, you're watching this today, and you're doing life on your own, and you're in the storms of life, and you're in the mountains and valleys of life, and you're in the throes of life and you have no hope, today's a great day to come to Jesus. He will see you through the storms of life. He has great promises. He is faithful. He is just. He will give you hope and peace that you've never experienced to this point in your life. So keep in mind who you listen to. Will you join me in prayer? Father God, You are amazing and sovereign and in control, even when our world is spinning out of control. 
Lord, I pray desperately that you would keep our eyes as your children focused steadfast on you. That despite the violent storms of this life and the turmoil and chaos of this present world, we would see you remain faithful and true and that you would move in ways that we can't even imagine. We thank you so much again for the hope that we have in you because of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. And if there's someone here today or watching this who doesn't know you, I pray that today they would come to know you, your love, your forgiveness, your peace, and watch and be amazed at how you move in their life. You are a great God, and we thank you for that. And we pray these things in Jesus' name.